Okay, um, let's pray and uh, let's get started. Um, okay, Nina, would you like to pray online, please? Uh, is it me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Gracious, loving Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that you have given us, Lord, to come together to learn from your word. Thank you for being with us in the week that has gone by. Even as we listen to your word, Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will open our hearts, open our minds to see wonderful things in your word. And we pray that the entrance of your word, we know, Lord, will bring light to our understanding and to our situations as well. Committing this time into your hands, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right. So um, let's pick up from lesson five. We got started in that. And um, I will go ahead and share the PDF for those online. Those of you in class. You follow with me in your notes. Lesson number five, common questions around creation. And we um, we went to the Genesis account in Genesis chapter one, uh, chapters one and two. And, um, and we are dealing with some questions along uh, concerning chapters one and two, right? So that's kind of what we're doing. Uh, we actually did get started last week, and so we'll uh, uh, move forward from there. So we talked about the gap theory. You know, when people say, uh, was the universe created as it is described in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, or the, the universe and the world, the planet, and things, life on planet. Um, uh, and uh, scientifically, the universe is supposed to be around 14 billion years old. Earth is supposed to be around 4 billion years. So how do we reconcile that? Right? We are saying God created everything in six days. We are saying these were literal days. Uh, we are saying, therefore, if you look at the biblical chronology, uh, the Earth is only about 6,000 years old, something like that. So how can you reconcile what science is saying, 14 billion years, Four billion years on the earth, of the earth. How do you put all that together? So, uh, what we were looking was that even in the Christian world, um, there are people who've come up with certain theories uh, in in order to try to match the two, right? To try to fit science into the Bible and so on. So, the first one was a gap theory, which is saying that somewhere between Genesis one one and Genesis one two. There could have been millions of years or billions of years. And that gives us, uh, you know, um, uh, gives a lot that may help explain why the universe could be 14 billion years old, the Earth 4 billion years old, and you find, you know, uh, 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 fossils that are, you know, hundreds of thousands of years old, and so on and so forth. So they try to fit that in. But biblically, uh, when we look at it, we don't find too much of chapter and verse to substantiate that. Right? Find one or two passages. And we are kind of in the ground of speculation. Like it's, we are speculating, we're imagining. Right? And we can't preach and teach some imagination as biblical truths. You know, it's very dangerous. So it's OK. Fine. Somebody says this, that it's like this. Uh, but literally, it's not something that the Bible is presenting to us, you know, uh, in a very clear, direct manner. It's something you say, okay, between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1, 2, it could have been like this. Yeah. The other theory, which we also saw last week, was the day theory. That means each day could have been millions, billions of years, right? But then we saw that, look, if you have to uh, 
if you have to use that word day, the, um, the, the Hebrew word yom, in a very consistent way, then everywhere else you have to interpret that as millions or billions of years, whatever you're saying. And then we find that actually everything becomes very absurd, right? That, okay, if God created animals and Adam on day six, that means he took like, I don't know, million or billion of years to create Adam, make Adam. Then he rested for another few billion years, <laughs> day seven. By this time, Adam may be 14 billion years old. <laughs> I don't know, seven plus seven, I don't know, whatever, some large number. Then he made Eve, and he brought Eve to Adam. <laughs> you know, so it just gets very absurd. Then if you take that and say, God is telling us, um, I want you to rest on the Sabbath, on the seventh day, how like how he rested. Uh, that means we have to rest one billion. We don't even live that now. <laughs> we don't live that long, right? I mean, if you keep everything consistent, right? Uh, so it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up, right? So uh, like that, uh, this whole day theory is a little weird. But the thing is, the fact is, there are some very, uh, maybe I should use the word prominent or well-known scientists who are Christians, who explain these things, who speak like that, you explain it. So, you know, uh, 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 it is easy that we can get confused. Hey, somebody so learned, who is also a Christian, who also believes in Jesus, is saying all this. So it's easy for us to feel like, oh, I have to believe what they're saying. But you don't have to. Right? You stay with, I will stay with the Bible. I make a choice. They want to say that. They want to believe it. That's up to them. But I will stay with you know what I understand as the scriptures. So the last one, uh, so this is where we have to pick up from page 22. Um, uh, C, A, B, C, page 22, C. The third uh, theory that uh, is proposed is, again, this is from the Christians who are scientists, right? And you will find a lot of books written on this. You will find uh, Christians who are believers who believe this. Right? So it's very confusing when you, when you see this. The third theory is of theistic evolution or a guided evolution. It's like God is a source of life. God started everything, but he let life on earth just evolve. You know? And he just... He was just saying, okay, it's happening. Suddenly monkeys became man. <laughs> then he just said, I have to send my son to redeem man. So it doesn't, again, this also doesn't add up, right? Uh, because, you know, many things, the Bible says, God determined before the foundation of the world. Example, he determined before the foundation of the world that he was going to send his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. And then, if you think like that, okay, God decided before the foundation of the world, and then he just waited billions and billions and billions of years for man to come. Yeah, doesn't make sense. And then what would be the big point of Adam coming and Adam and Eve coming and, and the rest of the story of Genesis? What happens to all of that, right? Uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and I mean, everything else gets uh, gone. But again, here uh, you'll find. Uh, Believers, Christians who subscribe to this, they say, oh, we believe in this, you know. So uh, the thing is, when we look at these different uh, beliefs, and these are all good people, meaning they are believers, they believe in the gospel, they believe in Jesus Christ, but then in these things, they are believing other, you know, these other ideas. So it, it can make things very confusing for us, right? So um, uh, my response would be just, you know, we stay with the teaching of the Word of God. You know, just say like, I believe that Genesis one one, Genesis chapters one and two is the way it is the way God created, and I believe it. It's just the way it is. Right? Six days, it's no problem. Right? Question number three, page twenty two. Right. So, if you believe that, then okay, let's look into Genesis one, 
and ask some other questions. How was their light on day one? If the sun was created on day four, ah, so no. <laughs> so how do you how do you respond to this, right? Because first thing God says, let there be light. Then afterward, He's saying, let there be sun and the moon and the stars and the firmament of heaven. He's saying that comes on day four. So it's very confusing. But very interesting. And let's read it. If you go to Revelation, right? And uh, okay, so in the book of Revelation, especially you know the last two chapters, twenty-one and twenty-two, is an uh, is a, a picture of the way things are going to be after God restores everything. It's like He's making everything new. Okay, so. It is after God makes everything new, new heavens, new earth. What will things look like? Right? So if you kind of you know look into that, Revelation 21. I'll just read these verses. Verses 22 to 25, John writes here. But I saw no temple. He's talking about the new heavens, new earth. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. And his gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. Right? You also look at verse chapter 22, verse 5. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Ah. Here you're having light without the sun. There's light, but no sun. New heavens and new earth. So you're saying, okay. What about then? When God said, let there be light. It was His glory, just like here. There was no sun. There is going to be no sun. There is no, going to be no heavens like what we know it with all these stars. It's going to be different. It's new heavens. So the outer space is going to be completely different. New heavens, new earth. And God Himself will be the light of this place. Okay. So now put this back in Genesis 1.1. Genesis chapter 1. When God said, let there be light, where did the light come from? He himself was the light. His glory was the light. Right? So into this darkness that was on the earth, his light shined. Right? Then he created the sun. So is that a problem to believe? No. If you believe God created the heavens and the earth, then it's no problem to believe that God made His glory cause light to be there without the sun. Because Revelation 21 and 22 tells us that's the way it's going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. There's going to be light, and God doesn't need the help of a sun to give us light. His own glory. The fact that He is there is light. So we can explain it like that. And it is there in Scripture. We're basing, explaining it based on Scripture. Then question number four. Yes, Anand. Uh, in 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 verse uh, uh, in verse four and in verse three, the then God said, "Let let there be light," and there was light. Mm. So when we are talking from these revelations, so He Himself is the light, right? So what is the need of uh, God to tell, let there be light? If he himself is the light from the starting itself, right? Then what is the meaning of uh, telling, let there be light? Okay. So he, we can understand it as, so the question, yeah, I think it's everybody heard the question. So we can understand this as God saying, let there be light on this creation, right? On the earth. So you can imagine, I, I don't know where heaven is. But God is dwelling in heaven. 
God created the heavens and the earth. And how were the heavens and the earth created? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. So God was said, let there be heavens. Let there be this vast expanse. And let the planets come. Right? So God creates everything. But it's a vast expanse. And there is no light yet. Right? So God is in heaven. And he has created this vast expanse. Now for God, it's him looking at it. It may be a very small thing. Right? Uh, this whole universe may be a very small, like playground or something. I don't know. Small area. He's saying the whole, he, he measures the heavens with one span. Hmm? So it's like this. He's seeing the whole thing. <laughs> Let there be heavens and all this. He's measuring one span. So it's dark in there. And God is saying, let there be light. That means into this universe, this heavens and the planets that he has created, he's now saying, let there be light. And then it's all in relation to the earth, planet earth. And then in relation to the earth, he says, the water divides land, vegetation, birds and the fish. Uh, of course, and then before that was the the stars, sun and stars. So the things, all of that is in relation to the earth. He's creating all this. So you can try to imagine God from outside, from heaven, speaking these things into something he's creating and he's forming. Right? Uh, so then one by one, he's saying what he wants in here on the planet. That's how I would uh, picture that, imagine it. Yeah. So that brings us to the next question. Um, huh, you say light, okay, but what about day and night? How is that going to be? How could there be day and night? Uh, you know, for us as we understand it, day and night happens through the revolution of the earth around the sun, the rotation revolution of the earth. It's going around the sun and, uh, and the rotation on its axis causes day and night. And uh, all of that. Now, there is no sun. Maybe the earth was ro rotating, I don't know, at that particular point, how it was, what was happening. Um, but it's saying God is causing day and night. Our response would be, and this, these are questions people will ask about Genesis chapter 1. So our response will be, see, we believe God himself was a light. And it was not a problem, no big problem for him to cause light to come from one direction, like how it comes from the sun, and for the earth to be rotating on its axis at that time. It, without At that time, there was no sun. There were no stars. For the earth to be rotating on its axis and to give, give rise to day and night as we understand it. Right? It's, it's like another step in the assembly process, the assembly of all the stars and all the life that he wants on the planet. It's like a step in the process. So at that moment, if that's how God wanted to do it, fine. It's okay. Revelation says there will be no night. There's going to be new heavens, new earth, no sun, and no night. Right? That's a different scenario. Is the earth going to be rotating then? I don't know. Is it going to be a round ball or is it going to be a flat earth? I don't know. But it's going to be new heavens and a new. Uh, how things are going to be at that time, we don't know all the details. Right? But God is, is given us some information. That's how it's going to be there. How was it then? He's telling us. He was the source of the light and there was day and night. So. I can imagine that maybe at that time the earth started rotating on its axis, light coming from one direction as it is now, and day and night on the earth being experienced, the earth experiencing day. Not a problem. Okay. Then, question five. So, this is a question. Um, why is this question important? Because um, 
this in Genesis 1 2, when it says the earth was without form and void, this kind of is the basis for that gap theory. So the gap theory goes like this Genesis 1 2 says, so Genesis 1 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So maybe he created everything perfect. Verse 2. But in verse 2, we are seeing an imperfect earth. The earth was without form and void, and there was darkness. So, question the question is what does that mean? Why was it without form? Why was it empty? Why was it dark? If he created everything in verse 1. Because of that, okay, something happened between verse 1 and verse 2. Then imagination works. <laughs> there must have been life on earth before between verse 1 and verse 2 that may have gone on for billions of years. And that, so we call it as a pre-Adamic world. That pre-Adamic world must have been destroyed. So the earth has now once again in a state of being without form and void. And so God is telling man, replenish the earth, and fill it up once again, things like that. So that is the, lo the the logic behind the theory. But it's all based on small, you know, we call it as nuances, you know, just because it says earth was without form and void, can you come up with some big theory like this? <laughs> you want us to believe that just because it says earth was without form and void or can you just be that you know God create it's a step in the process he created the heavens the vast expanse he created the earth and now he's going to fill it up fill up the emptiness the heavens and fill up the earth so it's just a step and the step process is very logical because every day he's doing something first the light they're separating the waters from the earth, the heavens from the earth, then causing the land and the sea, then causing the vegetation, then causing the sea and the creatures and the bird, then causing man, or the sun and the moon, the stars in between, then sea creatures, man. So it's a very, very, very logical thing how it goes. So that is fine, you know, that it's only a step in the process, but just because you find that the earth was without form and void, doesn't mean it was perfect and it was destroyed and now God is trying to restore it. That's a little too much. Right? So our response to that, without form, uh, it doesn't mean without shape, it still means it had some shape. Void, it means empty, uh, waiting to be filled, uh, doesn't mean that it is empty because it had been destroyed. It's just empty. Right? So I can keep a cup here. Cup is empty. You can say, my theory is, at one point the cup was full. Water went out. Now it is empty. So it has to be filled again. Or I can say, no. It is empty. We're going to fill it. Right? It's a new cup. I just bought it from the shop. It's never been used. It's empty. It's never been used. I just bought it. It's empty. So that's how you understand it. It's empty. It doesn't mean that it was full before. I could have just bought the cup and said it and just kept it here. Right? So uh it's just uh, indicating that the earth needed to be worked on. Question number six. Okay. So, again, this is an interesting observation that in chapters one and two, there are different Hebrew words being used in these two chapters. And I've, I've mentioned which, where it's being used. There is bara, asa, and Yatzar. 
Okay. So, why is it being used? Why are the different Hebrew words being used in chapters one and two when it's just talking about you know God bringing everything into existence? Is there some significance to it, etc.? Sometimes people, you know. Uh, uh, I'll just use the term. They make a big deal out of this. You know, oh, different words. Okay, it's true, it's different words, but it's all used in context with purpose. So the word bara literally means to create, as we understand. That means you're bringing something out of nothing. And the word bara is only used with God. God created. So God is the only one who's bringing something out of nothing. But the word asa is make. That means you're taking something and you're making something different out of it. Right? So uh, you're arranging, you're organizing, uh, you're giving giving structure. And then I, I listed all these verses there. So in Genesis 1 and 2, ch chapters 1 and 2, there are some things that are purely creation. And then there are some things that are rearranging organizing like okay he says let the waters come above the earth you're separating it's a rearranging you're not creating you're rearranging or let the water separate and let there be land okay you're rearranging you're separating these things or you know and and then you're forming and then the last word yet sir you're forming man right from the dust of the earth. Yeah. So that is forming and giving shape. But his spirit was created. Right? His physical body was formed. But him to become a living being, that's a creative work of God. It's a combination. Right? So we understand that it's not a problem. God is doing all three things. He's creating. He's arranging. He's forming or shaping. No issues, not a problem. Right? It's not like, uh, for us, it's not like, okay, it has to be, everything has to be just a creative word. No. There are things that he brought out of nothing. There are things he rearranged. And the things he gave shape and form to, it's fine. And God does all three things. Right? And last one. And then we'll take some questions. So, Question number seven, I and mean, this is where you know people can find fault um, with the text of scripture because it calls moon a lesser light. So, hey, moon is not a sun, <laughs> it's just a, another planetary body, it has no light of its own, it's not giving light, but the Bible is calling it lesser light. See, it's wrong. And you say, Look, there are a lot of things in the Bible that are just literary literary text that means um, it's not literal but it is more of a description the moon of course we know it doesn't have light of its own but the moon appears as a bright light when it is reflecting the light of the sun so it appears bright we know it doesn't have light of its own so it's just language, it's just literary structure that is saying it's a light, lesser light. It reflect, we know it reflects the light of the sun. That's all. So there are a lot of other things in the Bible, and which are also in our English language, uh, we say and we do uh, more as a literary form, the way we write, or like a poetic form. Uh, it's not to be taken in a literal sense. It's to be understood in a literary sense. It means this is how you're describing something, right? Like we can say, you know, um, uh, uh, some person, we can just use some phrases like, you know, that person is as calm as something, as a lake without wind on it or something. They're very still. Okay. You're just using a form. You're not saying that person is a lake. 
You're just saying the person is like a lake that is very calm and peaceful. Yes, use the comparison. Yeah. So, so, so that's a lesser light, right? It's not saying it is a light. You're just using a literary form. Right? So we can uh, respond to that. Right? So before we move forward, I just want to say, uh, see if there are any questions on Genesis chapters 1 and 2, the creation account as given in the Bible. So any questions on that? I've tried to put down some common questions that people have asked. But if there are any other questions? Uh, so here, like, we see uh, made, we, we saw the difference between created and made. And uh, like, the for made, uh, you have given the definition of something that is already there. Correct. So, so in here, in verse 16, God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. Mm. So it's like the sun and moon were already existed before. Mm. This was Genesis, which was Genesis? 16. Okay. Okay. So here, as we are telling God made it, it's like sun and moon is already there from beginning. He just rearranged them. Mm. So is it? Yeah, see, like one thing that is not so clear is when did all these other heavenly bodies, right, like the stars, the planets, did they come in to place in Genesis 1 1? And God, the Bible says, God created the heavens. Heavens means this vast expanse, heavens and the earth. Did all those planetary bodies, all the billions of stars, including the sun, did they all come in at that moment? Or did they come in in Genesis 1 16? Right. Uh, so, not very clear. Even I, I mean, I don't want to say it happened then or happened here. We're not sure exactly when. Um, so, when, when it says in Genesis 1 16 that God made the sun as the brighter light and the moon as the lesser light, it could be a rearrangement of the stars that were there, that were created in verse 1. He's putting it in, like, okay, putting this solar system here, put the sun here at the right place. Earth, you start rotating. Moon, you be here. Like it could be a rearrangement of these things that already happened in verse one. Like these all things happened, but maybe sun was somewhere. <laughs> we don't know. But in verse sixteen, he's putting them in position. You know, and uh, so that we have what we call as the solar system. I'm thinking like along those lines that maybe because we are seeing him do it that do that right. He created the earth, then he the earth was without form void, there's fully water. Then he's step by step he's creating the the sky above the earth. Then he's separating the waters and the land on the earth, like he's putting everything, you know, in order. And then he comes to this place where the sun, the moon is put in place, the solar system starts. So my thought, and again, this is just my thought, I'm not saying I can prove it, but my thought is, you know, maybe in verse 1, everything was there. Uh, this vast heavens with all the billions of stars, everything. And then the rest of it is, you know, how do we put up? Just rearrangement of things to the place where we have uh, the rotation of the earth and and the revolution of the earth could have happened let me just check the online class any questions from our online students yes francis uh, so it's like 
the core creatings on the god himself is the physical light so what happened to after that creating creating the sun to that light so after that he didn't need his glory like it's almost like god's okay sun this object sun becomes a source of natural light and he just withheld or he refrained his glory from causing that light right does that mean he changed his glory or anything no no he's still as glorious as, as he was and he, he always will be but in this period of time that is not happening and then when we come to revelation 21 22 it goes to the place where his glory causes the light on the new earth you know so he just you know and then also sometimes people individuals have encountered with the glory of god example saul of tarsus huh? he's happily going on his horse with all his people and suddenly one bright light comes and only to him huh? not to the people around him so what happened god just chose at that moment just for one man you know to cause his glory to be a very powerful light shock him blinded and uh, you know but only for him not for the others around him you know it's like so god chose to do that you know so we can just look at that example yeah so uh, fourth word genesis one fourth word god divide the light from the darkness mm. was for god divided the light from the from the darkness okay see again here i'm i'm only using my imagination okay i'm not i'm not uh, i can't i won't say that okay this is exactly how it happened i'm just using my imagination to understand and to understand it in in sync with the rest of scripture right that means there's the earth there was no light god caused his light from his glory to shine on the earth and yet, at the same time, he let some part of the earth remain without light. So what is darkness? It's the absence of light. So dark, darkness everywhere doesn't mean, now we are talking about in natural, right? In spiritual terms, when we say darkness, it means evil. But here we're not talking about good and evil. We're talking about natural things. So in nat the natural things, God caused part of the earth to experience light that was emanating from his own glory at that point. And part of the earth could not have that light. So we say that was in darkness. There was, there was no light there, that's all. So we understand it like that. Yeah? Why was God doing it? Because that's the way he wanted the whole earth to function, that the earth will have day and and he knew, I'm going to great man. He needs to sleep for some time. <laughs> okay, day and night. He knew that. That was part of, you can say, the original design. You know, so God had the design in mind. He was working towards, you know, just putting everything in place, which is very, un for, for me, it's like very understandable. I know, yeah, this is how we do it. And God was working towards that. And he, we see him actually do that, you know, and then he, creates man, puts him on the earth, and day and night. Okay, then day and night makes a lot of sense because you work during the day, you rest at night, right? And the earth is rotating. So everything makes sense. Yeah, yeah we won't need to sleep. <laughs> I think nobody will want to sleep. <laughs> so it's going to be a uh, different... It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be totally different where 
we won't have bodies that tire. We won't have these natural bodies. The natural bodies tire and need that, you know. But uh, it's going to be different the way. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, so in verse one it says the and the spirit of the Lord move upon the face of the waters, right? Mm -hmm. But we see that the sea or the sea came much la later on, right? So what is this water that was there before mm. when the earth was formless and desolate? Mm. So there was water covering the earth. Okay. Then he separates them. So verse ten. He separates. That means the whole. So you can imagine one the whole earth. There is land. All the land is covered with water. Then he's separated. Like okay, water you come here, land visible. So this land and thing that is the sea. So that separated water is called the sea. That is in verse ten. Any questions from Genesis 1 1 and Genesis chapter 1 and 2, please, from online students? We're just trying to think about, you know, uh, the kinds of questions people will ask us when we say we believe Genesis 1 and 2. Yeah. So just try to answer. I'm not saying we have all the answers, but we try to answer. Um, yeah. Uh, so in the sixth verse, you're talking about rivers, right? The water divides from waters. Yeah. I guess? Uh, it says over here, then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Yeah. So this one is firmament means sky. Oh, okay. So this is vertical division. Oh, that is the okay. uh, Water on the earth, water in the Sky, which okay. we know as clouds. Okay. Right? What oh, is yeah. that? Permanent. Yeah, okay. That is in verse uh, six, sorry. Five and yeah. Five and six. 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 <laughs> okay. Let there be a firmament sky with clouds, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let that. So this water is coming up. Yeah. yeah. Then verse 10. On the earth, water is separating from the land. Mm -hmm. So one is the sky. One is the land, oh. sea, sea and land. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you believe, believe everything. <laughs> yeah. But I think it is very logical. I mean, I, I don't find it a problem uh, that God is doing this. Step by step. I don't find it a problem. If you try to understand it. Like when you're trying to apply the rules that we have right now to what God is saying, it's very hard to explain. Like, it works hard like a test. That's what I think we see. Like you say, look, look, can we say that there are like billions of years old? But then scripture says that the case seven, seven days, you know. Yeah. yeah, so that's why in the very beginning we said the first thing is in the creative act of God, time, energy, space, it all came in one instant, and intelligence, design. It all happened instantly. Yeah. That's how it all started. So uh, when we think, oh, something like this, so intelligent will take so much time to you know, for God in an instant, you know, or so much energy or so much matter. Everything came. So that is that is why we say he's creator. He could bring everything into existence in a moment. So if you look at it from that perspective, 
no problem. God is God. In an instant, he can bring all this. And uh, if we study that and we say it, it took so many years, okay, it's from our perspective, we are saying it took so much time. From God's perspective, it was an instant. And uh, everybody's happy. <laughs> no? That's okay. Um, so, if there are no questions, we will uh, just prepare to get to the next. Yeah, you have a question? Genesis 2 verse 4. Um, why does it say, like, uh, it says history of the heavens and the earth? So, which means obviously it took. So, it says, uh, I mean, here in Hebrew, Talidith, it literally means generations. Okay. The word history. Mm. So, why did they say history there? Yeah, it's like, so, you know, he, he's again, this is just more of a writing. He's narrated everything in chapter one. He's, I mean, again, we should understand it was not written in chapter and verse. Like, okay, he's told us everything. I would have told you how everything was created. Now, let me go back and tell you something that happened during that time. Right? So he's just going back. He's narrating, okay, during that time, let me go back and start something. Then he gives us the details of, okay, when the plants were created, there was a garden, there was a river, there were trees around that, those rivers like that. And God had put man but particularly in this garden. So he's giving us extra information, which he did which he did not give us in chapter 1, to tell us this is how it happened, how the garden came, the rivers came, man put there, and then how man named the animals. That information was not given in chapter 1, so I'm giving you this. right? So yes, yeah, so he is using a word that is saying, talking about something that happened, already happened, history or generation or something. But again, we don't need to always understand that, oh, He's saying history means it's millions of years, or so generation means many people lived and died. No, no, no. He's very plain, very clear. It's about, I'm telling you about something in the past that already happened. I'm telling you about how the plants came. There was this nice garden. There were the rivers. And in that garden, he put Adam. And what happened to Adam until Eve came? Right? So he's giving us a little bit of, he's filling in the gaps in chapter 1. That's all. Go ahead, sir. Master, uh, here heavens and the earth. So I mean, there is no mention of other planets, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like there is no mention of living be living beings in on other planets. On other planets, there is no mention in the Bible. So, but we, I mean, now scientists are finding. They're yeah, searching, searching. Yes. Yeah, finding. They are telling their aliens are there. So, what about these things? So, um, the have so when the Bible uses the word heavens, yeah, of course it uses the word heavens in three diff three uh, three way different ways. One heavens is the sky, the the what we call as the sky or the the atmospheric heavens. The other heavens is what we would call as space, or we would use the word universe. It has all the stars and the planets, all that. Another way the word heaven is used is place where God is, right? Again, it uses the word heavens, but it refers to where place where God is. So here when it says heavens, it's talking about this universe. But it does not like, so like I said earlier, God could have created the heavens with all the stars and planets, everything in Genesis 1, 1 itself. Let there be heavens. I mean, this whole vast universe, he could have done it. And it is clear, or we could say this, the Bible is silent when we ask the question, is there life on other planets? So we like, ask the question, is there life on other planets? And I come to the Bible. The Bible is silent. What the Bible says is, the earth he created for man. So it's okay, earth is for man. But the Bible is, doesn't say there are no human beings on other planet. I mean, it is, there are no life on living things on other planets. This way or that way, yes or no. It's silent. Right? So 
so can we say the Bible says there is no life on other planets? It doesn't say that. Or can the Bible does the Bible say there is is life? That also doesn't say it's, it's silent. Right? So good. God says go and find out. <laughs> Happy searching. <laughs> but I've given you the earth. <laughs> earth is for you. Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break. There may be not for you. Yeah. Like all these, uh, all these things that will happen, and you also see that they say that there'll be things that fall from uh, from the sky, things sky. that come from the sky. So, uh, is that only like meteors and satellites that come down, or is it like uh, aliens coming yeah. down? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, just going by the context, yeah, it means uh, it's we can say it refers to these uh, planetary bodies that are coming uh, because there are going to be signs of the heaven, the sun, the moon, all of this. So he's referring to the context, is you know, from the context you take, it is referring to the planetary bodies and things like that. Uh, it does, it does. There's no implication of uh, aliens. Okay, we'll take a break and be back. We'll move forward after the break. Thank you.